in the mid-1920s at the Shibuya train station in Japan. A dog named Hachiko waited for his master, a man who would never return. Hachiko was an Akita, which is usually a dominant and independent breed, not exactly known for their patience. But Hachiko was an exception. Even for a dog, his loyalty knew no bounds. Originally born on a farm, Hachiko was adopted by Hadese Buro Ueno, an agricultural scientist. Hachiko was later taken to Tokyo when his master accepted a professorship at Tokyo Imperial University, which is where Ueno would later die of a cerebral hemorrhage. In fact, Ueno would die on May 21st, 1925, while giving a lecture. Every day before his death, Professor Ueno would pet Hachiko goodbye and leave him at the train station. You see, Ueno couldn't take his pet Akita to work. In the past, he had tried leaving the stubborn dog at the house, but Hachiko would always follow him to the station anyways to watch him get on the train. And when Ueno returned at the end of his shift, Hachiko would be there at the station to greet him. This continued to Ueno's seminal hemorrhage, after which Hachiko just kept waiting and waiting and waiting. Hachiko waited at the train station every evening, watching the trains roll in, anxious to see if Professor Ueno would finally step onto the platform. All told, Hachiko would wait for nine years, nine months, and 15 days for his master to return until Hachiko himself died of natural causes. Eventually, Hachiko would have a statue built to his honor, twice after the first statue was destroyed in World War II, because Hachiko had grown into a national symbol of undying loyalty, the dog that never gave up on his master. You're listening to The Reengineered You. This is a podcast about self-empowerment and all the myths, lies, and misconceptions we tell ourselves. Then we use science and history to bust those myths and re-engineer a better you. I'm your host, Todd Laments, the extrovert. And I'm the writer, researcher, and introvert, Joe Anthony, whose job it is to dig through the outer layer of no-duh on the internet and get us to the juicy facts. We can't have an episode about loyalty without quoting the American philosopher Joshua Royce. Royce said, quote, The heart of all virtues, the central duty amongst all duties, the willing and practical and thoroughgoing devotion of a person to a cause. Loyalty, the heart of all virtues, is our subject today. How fundamental is loyalty? How do others demand it from us? And how can we inspire it, like our example, Hachiko? And to help us, we have three myths about loyalty we want to bust. Myth lying. Myth one, loyalty is a virtue. It's all about placing your trust, your well-being in the hands of another. So why do so many companies demand your loyalty? Myth two, cults are creepy, right? I mean... Netflix is full of documentaries about wild-eyed cult leaders and false messiahs. Surely we would never give our loyalty to a cult. Myth 3. Loyalty is simple, right? It's just giving trust and showing support. So why are there so many books on leadership and seminars devoted to inspiring loyalty? But first, Joe and I are going to discuss who, if anyone, has inspired loyalty in us. So, Todd, I was wondering if you have uh, a personal scale or a rating for loyalty, in your opinion. I think I do. You think you do? Yeah. I, I've got I've got two tiers of loyalty. Uh, okay. uh, one is um, I'd help you move, like, out of your crappy apartment. Uh-huh. Uh, and that's not you specifically. I mean, any, <laughs> anyone moving from an apartment, um, usually they, they need a, a truck and people. A good back. Two strong back. hands. Yeah, so someone to lug the heavy stuff upstairs. And then the second tier of loyalty for me is, I'll help you hide the body. 
<laughs> now, there are, there are few people who have gotten on that second I tier see. with me. I'm, gu- I'm guessing it's crowded, more crowded at the, I'd help you move one. Than that, that. There's much more numerous, yeah. Um, but, but for me, I, I think that we're talking about how people have inspired loyalty in us. Um, the, the one that it's gotten to me the most, the, the one that's gotten to that second tier, um, of course, you know, family and close friends. Um, I've had a couple of mentors and teachers who have gotten out of that second tier. And for me, that, that seems to be the, the loyalty uh, hijack for me is, is people can get on that second tier with me if they reach out and they help me learn and educate myself and, and better myself. That's interesting. So it's not just because it's a cousin you grew up and you've known for 30 years. It's because they have helped you with something that means a lot to you. Yeah, they've invested in me, and I think that's a quick way to get loyalty. I believe. So, how about you? Who who are some um, who are people who have struck that loyalty button with you? I have a lot, but I'm going to share about one. And this is going to sound love and loyalty. It's going to sound like I'm talking about love and not loyalty. But to me, these things are blended together. And my partner, my spouse, my wife has put up a lot for me. I'm more human than most, Joe. And what I mean by that (laughs) is I make more mistakes than most. And she's put up with my addictions, uh, my anger issues, my unstable job changes, and my... the You know, my pay goes up and down like the stock market. Right, the roller coaster. (laughs) Yeah. And she's put her foot... She's she's strong-willed, and she's put me in my place. But more than that, I think um, the micro-changes... I know when I don't please her that I need to change my behavior. And she doesn't always have to say it, but I want her to be happy. I want to honor her, and I want to be loyal to her. I think that's lovely. And and those we've talked so much about um, uh, the five-to-one one ratio. Uh, have, you, have you practiced that with her? I do it all conscious? the time. And I realize, and what Joe's talking about in one of our earlier episodes on toxic relationships, um, a lot of times people think it's one for one. Like if you do something wrong for somebody or do something mean to somebody, you buy them flowers and make it up or you help them move and make them up. But we found out through study that it takes five things to every one thing. Right. Five positive comments for every one negative comment. Or, so or some of you listeners might be way behind. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so that that's it. Uh, um, that's a little bit of a hint at where we're going with this episode is um, if you want to inspire loyalty, one of the ways to do that is is keeping good with that ratio and also uh, um, reaching out and, and giving people your, your time and your knowledge. So once somebody has gotten uh, your loyalty, once they've earned it, uh, what does that mean for you? What would you do for them? I have a saying. I said that once someone does a lot of things for me, I kind of let them do anything to me. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I become their abuse. I didn't want to do a spit take into the microphone, <laughs> but that that seems about right. That sounds right. I feel like I owe them. Okay. Maybe a little too much. <laughs> well, that's that's good. That means you have a, a, a high, um, uh, you have a, a good sense for loyalty. That you you like having that. Uh, it seems like. And I, I think I'm a, overall as a person, I'm a lot harder on, my, on myself than other people. So I recognize when I see someone's talented in something and they've helped me with it, whatever it is, it's, it means a lot. That's, that's awesome. It sounds like we're on the same page as far as how people earn our loyalty. Um, do you mind if I ask you, have you ever had a, a loyal pet, like something like this Hachiko we're talking about? I have. I, ha- I had a cat named Sarah that I had for 18 years. And she loved me unconditionally. And when she passed away, I had ever put down. I couldn't do it. And, I, and I've been in the military. And I thought, you know, I'm not tough. I, I'm not, it's not going to bother me that much. I, I was in bad shape. This was way worse than anyone died in my family, Joe. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I just missed her constant, steady love. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the benefit of having a, the loyalty of a pet, I think. What about you? Have you had a, a pet like our hero here, Hachiko? <laughs> I was I was going to uh, uh, joke about how um, cats don't actually love you that they're they're pretending, but no, I'm kidding. I I, I had a cat. <laughs> it's all um, an act. <laughs> it's all an act. Cats are secretly just evil wrapped in fur. Um, no, I, I had a cat named Brock who uh, he would ride around on my shoulders like like he he got to where um, I'd be walking through the park and he was an outdoor cat, 
and he didn't want to deal with the dogs and he trusted me so he would just run up and he would ride around on my shoulders with me and we just walk around that is cool yeah and that tells you about the trust and loyalty he had for you he thought I could stop a Doberman, <laughs> which was that poor cat. I mean, he was way overestimating my abilities. But. He's never seen you run, obviously. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> That's If we ever got chased, then he'd, he'd learn really quickly you know, what the, the order of operations are. Um, so it, we're, when we're talking about loyalty, we're, we're not just talking about you know a dog waiting for you at a train station. We were talking human loyalty, um, loyalty as an idea, a concept. Um, but but our absolute best um, uh, sign of loyalty, the one the one example we could find that was as pure as we can get, is Hachiko. So what is what does Hachiko mean? The, the this name? is very interesting. Okay, it's a Chinese saying. It means Mister Eight. So he got named this name, and Mister Eight means in Chinese loyalty and royalty. So he had this name as a puppy. His name was Loyalty? Loyalty and Royalty. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And his relationship, he had a very special relationship with his master, obviously. They, and at the time, Tokyo, this was, it's a huge population now, but this is the, one of the first times it really swelled. So big dogs, Akitas like Hachiko, were seen as pests. They were seen as barn animals. They're seen being outside because they're big dogs, they're in the way. There's limited room, so small pets ruled Tokyo. And it's like still... having a mastiff in the city, basically. Yeah, it just doesn't fit in. Okay. So, and small dogs in Japan, I did some research off this too, and um, they are worshipped in, in Japan. We spoil our animals here in America, but nothing like Japan. They've got the, the salons, and they do it right. Okay. Yeah. So, Hachiko, um, we're going to we're gonna put him aside just briefly. Um Actually, do you want to do you want to talk about the the science of loyalty and and the mechanisms behind it a little bit? Um, Please. The the difference we're going to draw. Um, so, have you ever seen the cartoon Futurama? Yes, it's funny as hell. It is very funny. <laughs> There's one episode that started this um, this story. Um, I was looking for stories on loyalty to get this episode rolling. Um, and I found this because I, I just happened to have the TV on and Futurama was playing. And there's a devastating, absolutely sad episode where it shows this little dog that waited for Fry for years and years and years. Like it was his old dog back when he was in you know, modern time, before he got frozen and sent to the future, which is the, the shtick of Futurama. All of Futurama is about he wakes up in the future. Um, and it's about this dog that was, you know, loyal to him, and it waited for him outside of his pizza shop, and it sat on the sidewalk for years and years and years, and it, it does this montage at the end of the episode. So you've been laughing the whole episode, and then it shows this dog waiting for him until it dies of old age on the sidewalk where it last saw him, basically. And I, I thought, there's no way that's a real story. And and then I looked into it and found out it was completely real. It was based on Hachiko. All, f all fiction's based on nonfiction. Right, yeah. So, some writer was having a, a laugh um, at, and then made everyone else cry because the end of that episode is, is very, very sad. Um, now, the reason we, we talk about this is uh, human loyalty and, and animal loyalty. Um, so we're talking about the loyalty of a dog. It's far more similar than I thought it was. I th really? Yeah, it, it, they have put cats and dogs in functional MRIs, and they have had owners call out their names, and they have spikes of oxytocin and other um, uh, love hormones. So when we talk loyalty, loyalty is basically just um, a, a series of hormone that, that uh, indicates to you that you, you trust someone. And so cats and dogs, effectively, uh, uh, the, the trust level they have is similar to humans. I mean, I mean, there's going to be a variation because of the size of their brain and, and how many hormones they have in their body. Uh, but what that tells me is that they basically have the same feelings of loyalty that a human does. So when I said cats are evil wrapped in fur, they actually do, uh, even if they ignore their name, if their ear twitches when you call them but they don't move, um, same chemicals. 
Well, I have known this for years. So all of you animal lovers out there, when those dog and cats look at us with that love in their eyes, that's what it is. Yeah. So that's that's real. It was it was I just wanted to share it with you. That's that's not even on our op, uh, episode doc. Like that's not written in here anywhere. I just wanted to sh- you know, share with Todd that um, his kitten who attacks him may actually love him. We don't know this for certain. <laughs> Mia the cat. Mia the cat. Um, so now we're going to talk about human loyalty. Um, we start at the top with the Royce quote, the, the heart of all virtues. Uh, and I think there's a lot to that. Um, you can tell me if, if you feel the same way, but uh, when we talk about you know, who do you, who do you interact with in a day? You know, th- things that you want from friends, family, companions. Loyalty is, I think that hits the top of the list for everybody, right? Yeah, we do. And, and I think it is the little stuff. It, is, it isn't the, you can count them every day for the thoroughgoings, not the, you're falling off a cliff and they've got your head, right? Right. Yeah, we're, we're, there are levels of loyalty. Some of that also comes into, uh, um, they can be very loyal, but they may not be able to do certain things for you. Um, like, I would not trust some of my friends to stop a, a, you know, a lion attacking me. That's not about loyalty. That's about their abilities. Um, so, so loyalty is just really um, how, how much you trust somebody else. Um, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this one to um, psychology today. Um, they said loyalty is a survival mechanism that dates back to our caveman days. In the harsh environment of early man, giving and receiving support from the members of your family, tribe, or clan meant the difference between life and death. So for me, when we're talking, you know, whenever we get into psychology, we want to go back and look at early man, and we want to see that loyalty was just so ingrained in our survival. That, that's why it's such a, a, um, a building block, a heart of all virtues, that we don't even pay attention to it. We barely think of loyalty uh, unless we're watching a movie or a cartoon about dogs. Uh, then we, you know, get into loyalty. It doesn't get tested as much, but when you said that, it, to me, it reminds me right of the U.S. Army. I was in the Army, and you really do have to trust, and they need to trust you, and you have to be loyal to each other or else somebody will get hurt or worse. Right. You, you need to know the person next to you has your, um, has your back in a survival sense. They're not going to let a grenade land at your feet. But you're all kind of equal on the same pay and the same rank. When you get into a corporate setting, there comes a little more gossiping, backstabbing. The loyalty is definitely not life or death. Right. It's like I want them to fire Joe before they fire me. Right. So I'm, I'm glad you, you brought us there, because um, that is actually what um, the focus of this episode is, is really going to be about. Um, we want to talk uh, f- functional or actionable loyalty. Um, so the, the, the first, I, I feel like the first quarter of our show is basically, uh, here's what loyalty looks like when, we, when it's good, when it's, when it's family, friends, cavemen, dogs. Um, here's where we start defining loyalty when it is used, uh, not against us, but, but when it's a mechanism used uh, like a tool. Um, so, so at its core, uh, at its best, loyalty equals individual survival. Simple. Uh, will somebody else help you survive? So when we talk about businesses, um, we're, we're going to talk about, uh, well, actually, um, question real quick. In your wallet, do you have any loyalty cards, reward cards for for individual businesses? Yeah, like 15 of them, stamps and uh, different coffee shops and cupcake places. Right. I've I've got one for Ace Hardware and a a couple of them for for coffee shops. It's so strange that they they now refer to those as loyalty programs. That's true, yeah. What did they used to be called? Um, Yeah, rewards or gift cards or... That, Bonus yeah. cards or some uh, punch cards. Punch. There you go. Punch yeah. cards. Yeah. Free. Web. I guess I don't know. Get your your eighth sandwich for free. Oh no no that's that's um, that's not like official. That's just like what our family yeah. called them. They were just punch cards. Um, but yeah, it, it's the language around those has changed. Loyalty rewards. Yeah, loyalty Cause been programs. Loyal because since you've been loyal to us, we're going to be loyal to you. Right. So, so if wah, loyalty, wah, wah. Yeah. yeah, if loyalty is is all about survival, 
w- these companies are really just trying to hijack this this very core system to us to to sell us things. And we know we're being ripped off. We paid seven dollars for these Java juices to get a free one. We still we know we over we still know we paid for that thing. Right. Yeah. We we, we yeah. It may be a loyalty or reward, but we we paid our way to it. Um, I, I remember going to Seven Eleven and they asked if I wanted a loyalty card or a loyalty program, and if I'm signed up for it. I did the math and I, I realized that to get their credit toward um, a, a free snack, it, it would have been like a, a nine percent uh, discount on that food item for them to know all of my shopping habits. Um, so yeah, loyalty programs uh, are what we're kind of talking about. We don't want you to buy your shit somewhere else, is what that says. Yeah, basically, uh, we want to get you into the habit of keeping track of buying here. So businesses need our loyalty uh, individually; they need it to survive as an entity, um, and yet they are financially incentivized to get your loyalty for the lowest possible price. Um, businesses will buy our loyalty for a coupon and send it to your email rather than give you a great deal in the store if they can get away with it. Um, Likewise, an employer will try to buy your loyalty with perks and features if they can rather than raising your base pay um, when they can get away with it. There was a whole influx of books about that about 10 years ago. And and they were best-selling books and every entrepreneur business owner was buying it. It's how to reward your employees and get loyalty without paying them more <laughs> yes and they were selling off the shelf <laughs> right because because businesses require that like they it's such a core part of their model now is 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 this you know low cost loyalty it's the birthday cakes and the cars and oh we love you we're family yeah, yeah the second we don't need you anymore pay? we're gonna fire you <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the 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 cakes and the the um, little perks and the coffees. Um, I guarantee you that's going to cost less than raising your base pay. It sounds like I'm being sarcastic and condescending because I am because I feel this way about those things. Yeah. I feel insulted. I actually that is a perfect way to put it. The reason why um, Todd and I are uh, basting in our cynicism here is because we have both experienced um, being at the lower end of the corporate totem pole. And, and we know what it's like to receive uh, a free coffee in the lunchroom instead of uh, good health coverage. I call it being used for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not what you think of when you think loyalty. Those kind of loyalty programs, those are um, slaps in the face compared to personal loyalty, which is what we want in life. We want people to have that connection to us. So we're almost uh, uh, getting into political, uh, we're, we're getting into voting season. We're doing the, it's, what is it? We're a couple months away from the vote um, for president 2020. Um, have you gotten um, targeted ads uh, right. sent to you yet? Oh, absolutely. Just flooded with them on every everything I'm on. Okay. Um, have any of them, um, uh, have they made a bid for your loyalty? Have they tried to appeal to your sense of uh, nation? Or your, oh, absolutely. Yeah. In different ways, too. Or, or for how I feel about racism or how I feel about America or vets. It's trying to, yeah. Every angle it can come at yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, again... Based on my search history. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, for sure. Um, Facebook and... uh, I mean, now Facebook is saying they're not going to show certain ads for uh, political campaigns, but YouTube is not taking that stance. Um, So I I get flooded with um, YouTube ads for certain campaigns. And that's that's another way uh, loyalty is is not hijacked. That sounds too cynical, but another way that this loyalty mechanism is used is is political campaigns depend on it. They're pushing your emotion button. Yeah, they're they're appealing to our sense of loyalty, and and that hard baked in part of our mind where we know we need each other for survival. They're trying to use that to as a system to say, oh, you need us for survival too, and, and we need you, and we need each other. When in reality, they're just another um, entity who is getting paid and trying to buy your loyalty for cheap. Um, again, I know that's dripping with cynicism, but it, it's kind of true. I, I mean, five-star reviews for shows, uh, products on Amazon, restaurants, these are all displays of loyalty. 
Um, and in, in caveman days, loyalty would be sticking your neck out to remind everybody that Grog is actually a pretty good hunter, uh, even if he's having an off day. Loyalty now is going onto Amazon and taking the time to write something in your five star review of, of these fancy mics that we got or, or something. Um, so, really, business today, everything runs off loyalty. Um, and we barely give it a thought. Um, and if, if you don't believe me, I, I really encourage you to, to do your own research. When I was looking up loyalty, it was so hard to find scholarly articles for loyalty. Because for every one science article, there were 10 about how to build loyalty, how to manipulate customer loyalty, how to uh, um, get loyalty from your reviewers, your product buyers. It was bonkers trying to get sources for this episode. <laughs> and on the manipulate loyalty, none of it says do great service and make a better product <laughs> and a fair price. That promise isn't in any of those articles. Right. They, they were all how to build it uh, um, with tactics and, and with uh, splashy ads. None of scheming. it was. Yeah, here's how to just be a good entity in, in business. Back to our hero, Hachiko. Now, when P Professor Ueno passed, he had a cerebral hemorrhage at, while giving a lecture. Hachiko was given away right away to a new owner, multiple times. But every time, he would just run away to the station. He had that clock in his head to go to go find Professor Ueno. Now, we talk about dying, doing something we love. You ever hear people talk about that? Yeah. I don't think this is what they mean. Um, Usually you hear it when somebody like dies skydiving or rock climbing <laughs> or something. Yeah, well, Professor Ueno, who was an agricultural scientist, he became a professor and a very good uh, professor. He got promoted along the ranks at his university. He died given a lecture. Now, have you ever seen that speech called The Last Lecture by Randy Palsh? Mm -mm. It is one of the best. I can't believe you haven't seen this. It's one of the best speeches. It's up there with the MLK. And what it is, it's a very moving emotional. It's a professor, and he has been diagnosed with terminally ill cancer. But he's perfectly fit. He's perfectly healthy now. And he recaps his life. He talks about his family. He talks about his career, and then he talks about his career with passion. And if you, have to, if you need a good cry, <laughs> watch this. I guarantee I'll get you. That sounds incredible. Now, the reason I bring that up is because that's what... Our, our hero, Professor Ueno, died giving, a, giving a, um, a lecture to his students. Can you imagine how traumatizing that was for his students? Oh, my God. Yeah, no, that, unless he was arguing with one of his students in that moment. Well, that he had a breakdown. Right. He, he was only 53 years old. I mean, not like there's a good age to die in front of your class. Right. It, it's, that would be uh, doubly shocking if it's yeah, a younger man who keels over in front of you. But back to our hero, Hachiko. Hachiko, Akita is, again, big dogs do not belong in the city. They do not belong at the train station. He was seen as a pest. When he's with his owner, it's one thing. Mm -hmm. But now he's just wandering around, sitting, waiting. Um, he got chased off with sticks. I mean, he scares the passengers. He's bad for business for the shop owners. So they're trying to get rid of him. Okay. But over time, every day, the passengers started to warm up to him. They start to see him, they pet him, they bring him a treat. So they get like a two-minute dog time every day. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? I, I guess if there's no owner around, it's just the friendly dog at the train station. That, that's kind of cool. It's part of your routine. Coffee, donuts, you pet the dog, go to work. Yeah, I, I can totally see that. And then the shopkeeper started to come around. And they started to sit with him and get him treats and get him lunch and brush him. So this guy became quite the quite the celebrity. So don't feel too bad for him sitting at this station. He was getting a lot of good attention too. Okay, well that, that's I, I like that we have a little bright spot uh, among his his loyalty. Now this is a thing. This is a story about timing too. So one of Professor Ueno's former students was an expert on the breeds of Akitas. He went down there because he caught wind that the dog was dumbing down the station every day, and he wrote a paper about it. And the paper was well-written. It got a little press, got picked up by a few local newspapers, then national newspapers, and then what we call today, it went viral. 
Oh, there we go. So that's our moment where we we get in the news. So a lot of people are involved in this becoming such a big deal. Oh, that's awesome. So, quick question: with with an Akita like that, it, being so large a dog in the city, do you think that had an effect on how many people would like go up and pet him and and love him? And I mean, like if it's if it's just a tiny yapper at a station, I don't think it would have gotten the same love. And they're not Labrador retrievers. They do have a serious look. If you know Akitas, they look like wolves, kind of. I mean, they're yeah, yeah. Especially if you're not. These are city people. Yeah. So and they don't. Yeah, you don't go up to big dogs in, in the twenties. Right. <laughs> it was a tougher time then. Right. You get big, get your ass beat. It was no big deal. That'd be like getting off the train every day and just feeding the bear that's waiting for you. <laughs> that's a Russian one. It's a whole different. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll start that Russian episode later. <laughs> So I, I didn't want to do an episode on loyalty without us talking uh, cults. Mm-hmm. Love, I love every documentary on cult. I've seen every one at least, least once. I, I think that's why um, I want to get into this a little bit is because um, expressions of loyalty in, in the modern day and age, like we said, actionable loyalty, that's our focus. So loyalty and rewards programs, loyalty as it's demanded of us by, you know, political entities, business entities, jobs, as it's demanded of us by cults or or religious groups that are are asking for our loyalty. And I got to put this out there. Joe and I have talked about for years because we watch these shows and we talk about, we gossip about them. We're like, how did these rich, smart people (laughs) fall for this? Don't see this, you know obvious bs in front of them right um college educated um people who who should know better or at least should be able to recognize it and i have a couple answers uh they're they're more speculation than research we're going to get into the research too um but but after reading I, i i it could be spiritual idealism uh um it could be a sense of belonging it could be tigers uh, um, we, we, I won't let an episode pass without us talking about Tiger King, but that had a very cult-like feel to it, too, that the people on Tiger King oftentimes talked about, you know, that they, they felt like they were, you know, getting into the truth of the universe, that having a giant, powerful beast next to them, it was almost a religious experience. And they would just fall in love with certain ones, ones that they cared for that would just... And you could hear them on the show from all the different ones. They talked about ones that had passed from years ago, and they talked about them and started crying. Yeah, like they were family members who had passed. Not just a pet. Not just a... I had a, I had a quick question for you because we're on this subject, and I, I saw this in our, our show notes uh, over and over again. Um, you mentioned a, a, an effect uh, uh, where you would meet people in religion who felt spiritually superior because they were closer to god uh, could you explain that a bit it is and anytime you're a, a member of a church and stuff there's a certain kind of um the pastors have it you know everyone thinks they're, they're a little bit closer to god they have a direct call to him they've got his cell phone number and then some of the other leaders in church sometimes it's based on it's usually based on their status in the church okay and they say they got that status because they're such good clean livers they're living the right life they're living the good word and they can get stuck up and use it as kind of a bullying tool tool like oh i'd, I'd like to have her in my and i've seen i've been around this all my life and i've seen oh, i'd have her in my wedding if she was just a little closer to god you know i don't think we need to have <laughs> which so, is the exact opposite of what christianity or jesus would do Right. Jesus wouldn't uh, push somebody outside of the the group. We'll give you a point system because you sing a little louder or you give a little more, you know. Right. Yeah. So you move up closer to God. But it, but as humans, we get that point system in our head. Yeah, we. I don't think we can escape hierarchy. Like, like we have it built into us as social animals to, to rank each other. Uh, to see our ourselves uh, compared to the group and give ourselves a number. And I think that religions, and I'm not lumping religions and cults together, but I think they both do exactly this. Uh, the research we're about to get into uh, shows this too. This isn't a, a, um, an out-of-the-box phenomenon. It's not something that is, you know, uh, um, only a certain type of church does it or only a cult does it. 
Um, I think this demanding of loyalty and ranking ourselves uh, and ranking each other, that that is integral to forming social groups. And thus it's integral to loyalty and, and forming a, a religion or cult. Um, so although I say them almost interchangeably, we're focusing on cults here. Um, and a lot of these cults do what, what Todd is talking about. They, they, um, it's, it's not just not inviting someone to your wedding because you don't feel somebody is as godly as you. It's, um, I have the ear of God, and so I, I, can, I can tell you what he thinks. I can tell you what's in the mind of God. I can ease your pain. I can get you the rewards you want. Yes. Um, Shortcut, a hack. Yeah, exactly. They they have the answers. I think that's the shortest, quickest way we can say it is somebody in the organization has the answers. Everyone else needs them. Whether the answer is, I know how to get to tigers, or, or I know how to get to God, or I know how to get to spiritual wellness, or uh, better grass-fed uh, beef, whatever it is. You can have a cult around anything as long as you're the one with the answers. And I can fill that hole in your heart. I can, yeah, exactly. Um from our own experience, um, uh, we've been a part of uh, Toastmasters groups, and they can feel pretty cult-like if you find the right social group. They do, and they get clicky, and you start holding people. Yes. Just so you know, Joe is one of those. I, I am a cult leader, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. If you go to Toastmasters with Joe, Joe can do no wrong. <laughs> And if you criticize Joe, you'd be kicked out of, you'd be banned from international Toastmasters. I would wave a scepter <laughs> and my followers would drag you through the street. I roll my eyes every time I see people <laughs> gushing over Joe. I go, shit, he's, not, he's all right. Well, it, it, Todd knows me when the shoes are off. Like, so he knows the weird stuff I say. Yeah. Yeah. Before makeup, I know, who, you know what he looks like. Right. Well, what we're talking about is in, in, in Toastmasters, um, I very much utilize uh, um, what I've learned in storytelling to, to tell people how to um, give better speeches publicly. He hijacks our mind with a narrative. Yes, that's exactly right. Uh, and so it, it, it can get a cult-like feel because I have answers and, and everybody in that moment needs them. So, so we're... We're joking and being glib about cults, but really it's just you find someone with the answers, and if that person also happens to want to rank you and assign you a position in the organization, then you start getting into cult territory. So we kid, but it, that is the building block. But And I'm joking, too, because I've brought people who are lifelong Toastmasters who have won awards, won speech contests. They come. They don't know Joe. They hear Joe talk one time, and they say, whoa. What was and then they and you can tell when he's he's a great speaker, but people run up to him after his speeches and they want to share. So whatever his his message is, whatever he's doing with the narrative, it's working. It's touching people. It's getting them built up an emotional state. Yeah, it's earned. And and hopefully they they take those those lectures about narrative away and and they can continue sharing good stories. Um, now now. Cult leaders, they, they oftentimes use the same mechanism to the storytelling mechanism, and, and we're going to get into that too. Um, so th this comes from a, um, a book and a series of articles uh, by Dr. Margaret Singer. Uh, she wrote something called Cults in Our Mist back in 1996. Uh, and Singer mentions uh, six conditions of cultic control. Um, we're only going to read the titles because I encourage everyone to, to look this up. Again, it's Dr. Margaret Singer. Um, and Todd and I are going to we're, we're going to talk the title of each of these six conditions, and then we'll discuss them in comparison to our, our own brief uh, experiences and organizations. So, step one for building a cult. Oh, actually, um, let's frame it like that. That sounds fun. Todd, you and I are building a yeah, cult. Yeah, the re-engineered you. The re-engineered. We you want cult. your money and your body. Right. <laughs> in no particular order. Uh, we, yeah, we are the, what is it, deacons? What do we want to be? Emperors? <laughs> uh, um, so we're building a cult. Uh, we our gotta, first step. <laughs> we got to figure this out, though. <laughs> yeah, what are our titles? Um, the first gurus. step to building a cult. The gurus. The gu oh, there we, there we uh, go. Gurus. Dueling gurus. Yeah, the doolaroos. Um, step one, uh, keep a person unaware of what is going on and that how she or he will be uh, changed one step at a time. Um, so the goal of a cult, to, to break that down a little bit, uh, the goal is to change someone uh, and you don't want them to be aware of those steps. 
Uh, so when they show up looking for answers, like I said, we, we have answers to questions. We, we have the secret, quote unquote. There's a reason why all these cults start with someone who says that they are literally a, a messiah or a god reborn or that they have a connection to heaven. Mystery. Yeah. yeah. It, it's mystery and they there's a heavy implication that they have answers. And when you go to seek that from them, instead what they do is they, they slot you into the organization. They give you a rating. Some of them actually quite literally have a numbered rating or a phase rating or a ranking uh, and then they begin this series of change. And if you are the cult leader, you can't let the follower know they're being changed. So step two, control that person's social and physical environment, mm-hmm. especially control their time. So, so get them with all your people away from their people. Yes. And keep them busy serving in your cause. Keep them on in front of you. Yes. The The... I was going to say the best cults. What I meant by that is the most notorious cults. Um, they have regimented schedules. And, and they're usually down-to-earth cults. Like a lot of cults, there's a reason why a lot of them are like, um, they're almost hippies or they live off the land or they do a lot of farming, a lot of community work. It's to keep them busy. A time burglar. Yeah, a time burglar. You're it's, never done with work on a farm. You never wake up on a farm. So there's nothing to do today. There's right. plenty to do. Cults don't work if you have uh, 10 hours of free time every day. Uh, You really have to keep people's time busy and and keep their hands busy so they don't have time to consider what you've basically asked them to do with their life. Um, Step three, systematically create a sense of powerlessness. Todd and I already touched on this a little bit, but um, yeah, strip them away from their old life. Um, Less individual, more group cause. Right. Right. Make them reliant on you. Do that financially, if possible. I, I mean, we kind of, when it comes to loyalty, we do that with each other. Uh, um, a couple gets into a, a, a apartment or a house, and then they're tied together, whether they emotionally are into it anymore or not. Um, again, that sounds pretty cynical when I say that out loud, but really, it's, it's as humans, we are prone to um, uh, throw in our lot with each other. When we find someone we can be loyal to, uh, we will we will get behind each other and we'll get into uh, invested situations. That's what a cult does to you is they they get you to give up your money and your your physical things. And the reason they do that isn't because they need it. It's not that they're asking you give up all of your monetary wealth uh, uh, to be closer to God. The real reason is they need you to be dependent. So the next step is um, manipulate a system of rewards, punishments, and experiences in such a way to inhibit power, uh, excuse me, inhibit behavior that reflects the person's former social identity. Uh, So to put that into uh, a little bit easier terms, um, you you have a system of rewards and you have a system of punishments. um, And and you need that to, um, you you need that to uh, play into the identity you're handing to someone. So if I'm in a cult, if we're building our, our, our cult here, Todd, um, if we get a new member, uh, we need to build in punishments that reinforce their new position. Um, so the first time they speak up to us, the gurus, uh, if they say you're wrong or if they tell us you don't have the real answers or if they question us, that's the real big one is questioning. Uh, then we have them, let's say, uh, uh, they have to listen to three hours of our audio. That'd be horrible. It, it, they will be in <laughs> they tears. They would never do that again. <laughs> yeah, th- that's a, the punishment that will, the, yeah, they'll learn fast. A, yeah, the, 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 they need additional training. They're, they're confused. Yes. Uh, um, but if they don't question us, if they, if they uh, obey what we say, then we reward them, and I can't think of a, a, an appropriate reward from us. That that would be not listening to us, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, this is what they do in the cults, and I've seen this. They will move them closer to the gurus. Oh. They have a status upgrade. They get more time with the gurus. So the rest of the cult members see that, and they know why. It's because they've been agreeable right. subconsciously. 
So that that is that's perfect. They, they 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 get to spend an extra thirty minutes to an hour with us, or they sit at the right hand of our table. Hopefully, having sex with us. Right. That's, that's <laughs> it. Won't take that long. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> that's the secret to most cults. Is is a lot of it is a, a sexual exchange. So, uh, spoiler: um, the cult loyalty build is is mostly just to get people uh, um, sexually engaged. Um, uh, we already kind of covered number five, uh, manipulate a system of rewards, punishments, and experiences uh, to promote learning the group's ideology. So the first thing is you, you reflect a person's former social identity. The, the next one is a, a system of behavior and rewards, and that's for um, the group's ideology. So what, what Todd and I said, if somebody does well, we, we immerse them more into the group's ideology. We, we sit them at the head of our table. We take them under our wing. And rewards, believe it or not, is, is additional responsibilities. More work is actually seen as a privilege because they trust you more. I know this sounds crazy. Oh, no. It, but it, this, it, is, it, this is not just in cults. We're, we're doing the cult thing because we're showing how people who are, are educated and do have all the means can fall for this. And we fall for this on other levels in other groups. Right. Following the exact same things. Oh, we're, we're about to get to that. Yes, uh, Todd is making connections here. Um, um, yeah, there is a reason why we're bringing up uh, the, the cult system and the way it aligns here. Um, so we got, we got one more of these, and then we'll, we'll make that connection. Uh, put forth a closed system of logic and an authoritarian structure that permits no feedback. So to Todd's point, um, you can't question us or you get punished. If you accept what we say, you get rewarded, and the rewards are more responsibilities. Um, also, if you look at all six of these, uh, that's also known as um, my job. Uh, uh, or, or if you look at... True life. Yeah, most people's office jobs, a lot of these six steps actually are pretty close to how uh, office, uh, offices and jobs set up loyalty. Scary. Scary, yeah. Um, it does. Yeah, loyalty programs, uh, loyalty systems at work, they, they very much follow what cults do. The only real big difference I can see is um, you're supposed to be rewarded uh, creatively if you question things. Uh, uh, most jobs, to, to get a better product, to get a, a better uh, meeting, to have more productivity, you're supposed to question things in a, um, a, a critical yet helpful way. A way that builds up um, what you're trying to accomplish, and you can't uh, and you can't say anything negative about your boss when you're given any kind of. <laughs> you can't. That's true, and or that's you'll be tortured. Even if everything you said is true and could save the company money, you will be. Yes, yeah. We um, we we covered that in one of our episodes recently about about giving feedback and how a lot of businesses don't encourage it. Um, so yeah, a, a lot of these. I mean. Go through those six steps again, uh, and it really feels a lot like how we treat jobs, how we treat loyalty programs in general. And take it to your church, or to your clubs, or wherever, and say, "Have does that some of this stuff look familiar?" Five I think out you of might six. see it lines up. Yeah, uh, so many, um, like I said, uh, clubs, religions, churches, jobs, um, because they they hit five out of six of these. Not not quite perfect fit for a cult, but pretty close. So one last thing I wanted to cover with cults real quick before we move on. Um, I want to talk about uh, John Bowlby's uh, attachment theory. Um, so the attachment theory is that uh, children and adults will generally seek closeness uh, um, to... Well, they'll, they'll, they'll attract to safe people when they're stressed in order to gain protection from a threat. Um, so for children, think of like uh, a kid gets scared and they run to mom. And they hide behind her skirts. Um, or if as an adult you get scared, you run to either the police or, or the biggest guy you know. <laughs> or, or, or just somebody competent you know. So we, we have this instinct. It never goes away. Um, as you grow up, it, it doesn't change. Everyone gets scared. They run to someone. They've, they've picked someone out in their life that they can trust. Uh, the way cults kind of utilize this, and, and organizations utilize this too, um, make someone feel powerless and have a system of rewards in place. And when they feel powerless and they feel isolated, they will run to somebody in the organization. And all you have to do to capitalize on that is uh, make sure you're that person. 
So if you have somebody in at a job, say, uh, you have like say human resources. If I feel threatened, I go to human resources. Or if I feel threatened, I go to uh, an upper manager if that's unavailable. Um, cults will have uh, a leader, uh, and below the leader, you will have basically his deputies. And if you feel threatened or scared, um, you go to them. That's the trick. Is um, they the reason cults have an element of doom and gloom in them, and they they talk about how the world is ending and and everybody is in moral decay and panic and. Uh, hellfire brimstone uh, again this is going to sound really churchy but there's a reason for this um it's because when you instill a sense of uh powerlessness they run to a leader so um not just cults but everyone if if you find yourself under a leader who instills in you a feeling of powerlessness who tells you the world is falling down Fire is raining down. Uh, groups are roaming the streets ready to attack you. Um, question whether or not those are true. Look at the statistics, the reality of events. How, uh, how, how immoral are things? How dangerous are things really? Look at the stats, not just you know pictures. Um, and if you find out that somebody is trying to make you feel powerless, next step is... Who do they want you to run to? Who are they expecting you to go to for loyalty? Because your sense of loyalty will really determine who you're running to, who you're seeking that safety from. So I, I don't really want to um, be uh, leaving everybody on such a, a downer thought. Um, so could you drag us, drag me kicking and screaming back to our main story? Uh, could you tell us how, how Hachiko... After um, getting this notoriety for uh, the articles, uh, how did things end up with uh, Mr. Eight? Our loyal pooch, Hachiko. Not a, not a member of any cult. <laughs> Almost a cult leader himself, it sounds like. <laughs> he dies of natural causes after all these years of waiting. Now, Tokyo, the city of Tokyo mourns. The whole country of Japan mourns. Hachiko, his passing made national headlines. He was cremated, and he was reunited with Professor Yudo at that cemetery in Tokyo. The master and his dog were together again. His body, though, his fur and everything, was stuffed, preserved, and mounted at the uh, Science Museum in Tokyo. Okay, so he got a, he got a statue, and then another statue, and his body is, is stuffed at the museum. And it's something, that, to me, that resembled a parade. I mean, people were crying and throwing themselves. Lassie didn't have a, a, a going out like this. This was really something. Wow. This is, this is what's going to happen when Ugly Cat dies, or, or Grumpy Cat, that's it. <laughs> no, I thought this was very interesting. And to me, this is, I don't know, I just thought this was cool. Okay, they didn't know the exact reason that he died until 2011. So this has held people's attention, kind of like I like to watch those cold cases where they have DNA evidence that, yeah, so they're still researching this in 2011 and found out what kind of cancers killed him. Really? Yeah. Very wow. famous dog people. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, obviously it, it came up in an episode of Futurama, so people are still thinking about this. But but and it's because it's something that everyone respects. It's a value and a core thing that this dog had that isn't very common. Yeah, they have that level of loyalty. For that long. So can we... Can we finally get to the the self help? Can we become gurus now? Yes, we got to earn it. We got all we these people it, following yeah. us, having sex with us, giving us money. How do we inspire loyalty, Joe? We need to become Akita dogs. Uh, uh, that's the. I think that's the ultimate answer. Um, so I've got these suits here. They're stuffed. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, we we unfortunately can't do what um, what uh, uh, Mister Eight did, Hachiko. Um, so we're going to go through a couple of um, notable steps. When I say notable, I mean like everyone who is in self-help has heard of these. Uh, we're not telling you anything particularly new, um, but we are going to talk about practical things. So these are, these are actionable things you can do. Our first one is a little bit counterintuitive. And I want to cover this one first because I personally use this and I think it's effective. It's called the Ben Franklin Effect. 
Todd, have you ever used or heard of the Ben Franklin effect? No, but I'm a big fan of him. He was the first self-made millionaire in this country, Mr. Mr. Ben Franklin. Yes. Uh, Smart guy. Clever, clever dude. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, a lot of fun, controversial stuff he did. Um, but um, I remember... Yeah, not all of it was legal, by the way. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, ben, ben Franklin, when you read his diaries, man, that, that yeah. guy. Uh, he, he was like, I remember he was like the first guy that was like, walking is good for you, and everyone thought he was nuts. Like, he's like, <laughs> what are you doing? Sit down. You're yeah. going to you're gonna die from, you know, flux or something. I remember him frequenting prostitutes, and then the other one was... Um, when the United States ran out of metal for bullets, he said, hey, and he was a printer. He said, I'll make the currency for the, co- the country. I'm happy to do it, to serve. Yeah. Of course he did, you know. <laughs> of course he'll, he'll it's awfully big of you. make money, yeah. yeah. It's very nice. Well, um, Ben Franklin uh, came up with this thing. Uh, it, it was something he did to his political enemies. Um, he, he would ask them uh, for a book loan. Uh, or a favor, really, just any favor. And they call it the Ben Franklin effect because the idea is once someone has already performed a favor for you, they're more likely to do another favor because they have to justify why they did something nice for you. Oh, so, bad money um, after bad money. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, Todd, if, if you and I were enemies, if you just, not enemies, but you just particularly didn't think much of me, um, I would have asked you for something. I would have said, can, can I borrow a book or, or could, could, you know, could I get a pen from you? It can be small, um, but bigger is better in this uh, with the Ben Franklin effect. Because then you're going to try to justify it by another big thing. Right. If you help me move out of my apartment, I'm still stuck on that today for some reason. Um, <laughs> you now have to come up with reasons why you would do that. Like, why am I helping this guy? I don't even like him that much. And then you're like, well, I work with him. Uh, He's a pretty smart a guy. And yeah, yeah. The next thing you know, you're on his team. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what Ben Franklin would do is he would slowly shift people onto his team um, by repeatedly having them. And, and you'd think it'd be the opposite. Like, you'd think... To make friends, to make people like you, you, you have do, to do, do things, nice things for, for them. them. Give yeah. them things. It's the opposite. It's the opposite. That's it, interesting. Both work. Be doing doing nice things is a good thing, uh, um, but getting them to do you favors, uh, it makes them justify it. Ben Franklin, you are a scoundrel. Yes, <laughs> in the we best love, way. But we love you. He's the American <laughs> style scoundrel. <laughs> Our next one is uh, Dale Carnegie. Uh, his his phrase, be hearty in your approbation and lavish in your praise. Um, so what, what that means is um, just be, uh, when you want to compliment people, make sure it's about something truthful and honest. Don't give empty compliments. Um, and, and be lavish in your praise. And uh, one of the things I loved about his book is, is he talked about when you, when you speak to people, speak to them about their interests. And I like this because... Um to me, this is being mindful, being present. With Lynn. I'll do it in a corporate setting. Uh, a lot of times people are very critical, but if, you, if you're really being thoughtful and you're really observing someone, you can give them, you can compliment them, and it'll make their day if it's true and, and Absolutely. honest. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that truthful, honest part, that, that is the harder part. That actually takes real effort. You, you have to compliment them on something that they think about, they spend their time dwelling on. That you hit it. You have to exhale you, and you have to just breathe them for a while. Yes. And their values and what's important to them and how they're perceived around, and then speak to that. Right. And their that, truth. that is tough to do. Um, uh, I was talking to uh, uh, somebody who was working with me on a, a creative project, a, a story. And um, I, I told him when people compliment uh, somebody who, who is writing something, uh, all writers love hearing compliments, but um, the best ones are the ones where they actually listened and read. Um, and, and it's tough to compliment somebody creatively because you have to understand their process sometimes. You have to you have to know that something went into it. So if you can, Dale Carnegie is a good way to build loyalty. Uh, be hearty in your approbation and lavish in your praise. Uh, I want to go through um, five quick values. Uh, and this is from a Forbes article by Carol Gorman. Uh, sorry, Carol Goman. Um, here, are, here are some quick things, and, and, and Todd and I can break some of these down. Um, encourage your people to continuously improve. That builds loyalty. 
Um, I don't know about you, Todd, but I mentioned earlier uh, mentors and educators get my loyalty very quickly because they are improving you effectively. Uh, trust your people. That's another good way to build loyalty. Um, know them and include them. So it's not really just enough to trust people. You have to, you have to know them as people and include them on your projects, whatever you're working on together. Um, share values. That, that's kind of a, a no-duh one. But, but honestly, I can't tell you how many times I've collaborated with people and I've thought about it afterward and I realized our values don't match up at all. I was just doing it to get a, a job done. Um, join their team. So, so don't just get them on board for your project. This is the way I interpret this is, is you have to join in with things they're working on too. And Joe and I have both done a lot of this in mentoring and in our, in our public speaking stuff. We've mentored a lot of people, and you get 10 times out of it mentoring than being the mentee, I think. I, I agree. It, it, not only do you have to re-educate yourself whatever you're mentoring them to do, you also get to watch them do the process. And whatever they're doing, whatever you're into as a group, whatever you're mentoring them for, um, you get to watch them grow, and you get to learn from all the mistakes they're about to make. So it's a, almost a riskless system if you're the mentor. Um, and then finally, uh, if you want to inspire loyalty, motivate people. Do, do it shamelessly. Do it, do it in good fun. Uh, but, but feel good about doing it. And, and other people feel good when they're motivated too. So it's, it's generally a, a, good, um, a, a good rewarding way to, to earn loyalty. Earning loyalty is, is, I think the real takeaway here is it's not just for businesses and bosses. Loyalty in a nutshell is um, making someone your partner in something you're doing together and show that you're willing to take that caveman risk for them. You're willing to go out and club a bear with them if you need to. You're not going to kill Joe today. He's hunted good before. He'll be back. <laughs> That's right. Once I, that I gout is gone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, once, once my clubbing arm is uh, loosened up and it's not so, uh, yeah, it, it, we'll, we'll, we'll be, we'll be uh, eating well again. Um, there's a great, uh, not a quote. Well, it is a quote. Teddy Roosevelt, um, when he was leading the Rough Riders up uh, San Juan Heights, while under fire, uh, he didn't yell, uh, uh, you know, uh, go or charge, or he didn't point his saber in the distance and say, kill him. He said, follow me. And then he ran up the hill like a crazy person. I love that. Yeah. yeah. That to me. That's th a leader. That's loyalty. Yeah. yeah that, that's, that's where loyalty that's comes from. That's trust and loyalty. Summed up. And speaking of, of symbols of loyalty, um, we want to get back to, to the dog. Now, we talked about how he died, but that's not where the story ends. So, Todd, could you, could you take us home with this? Speaking of symbols, Hachiko was a very important symbol for Japan. And when he died, the whole city of Japan, they did a fundraiser. They did donations. And they put a bronze statue where he used to wait every day for nine years. <laughs> so... I wonder how many people a go got fund me. <laughs> yeah, a, a go fund me before World War Two, basically. Now the problem is okay. So World War Two started right after it, it goes right up, and then World War Two starts. They need that ammunition. They need the the bronze for bullets for ammunition. So they comes down right away. So they melted it down and made bullets. Okay. But not t about ten years later, um, fifteen years later, nineteen forty eight. A new statue went up at Shibuya Station, and it remains there to this day. And it's a busy station. Our hero, Hachiko, has his own exit at the station. <laughs> and I like to see everybody still standing there, maybe petting his little paw, you know, right. still doing that part of their routine. It makes you feel good. And he's there to greet everyone, not just the owner. That's right. Um, years later, in 2004... Um, in his hometown where he was born, a new statue goes up. So this is, count them, Joe, this is two statues for one dog. We got two yeah. statues. And can we count his stuffed body at the... Uh, at the uh, I don't know the where that is. That's MIA, so okay. <laughs> that doesn't count. Okay, two statues. Uh, 2015, um, the University of Tokyo put up another statue. 
and this is a brass statue. It was celebrating the 80th anniversary of his death. Okay. Yeah. Now, the real hero in this for um, Hachiko is not what he did because the professors passed away. It's how he built so much loyalty and so much love in the people of Japan. But he did something even bigger. Um, if it wasn't for his story, Akita's at this time were near, they were flirting with extinction, Joe. There was only 30 documented Akita's in the whole country of Japan, with Hachiko being one of them. But because of all of this press, and all these people could see what a hero dog these were. They couldn't keep killing these dogs. They were they were put up on this pedestal. So he saved his breed. Oh wow! Yeah. So he he was like their lassie. Like his his breed became uh, uh, not immortalized, but but popularized by it. Absolutely, and it was that close again. It was flirting with extinction. So what kind of reward is that? He saved all Akitas and showed what great dogs, loyal, independent they are. That's awesome. <clears throat> so, recapping this, the dog has three statues that we could go travel to today. He's also had a major motion picture made of him about his life in Japan and a major motion picture in America. Three statues, two <laughs> movies. How many politicians, celebrities do you know that have that? Right. And uh, one unofficial Futurama uh, nod. <laughs> <laughs> Loyalty is one of the most fundamental and rewarding parts of the human experience. When you find true loyalty in a partner or friend, it feels like wrapping yourself in a warm blanket when you're trapped on a glacier. And yet, businesses... Politicians and employers treat your loyalty like cheap currency, and they're not shy about asking you for it either. Loyalty is something we all seek, even from groups that would capitalize on our desperation, our need to belong. Cults go out of the way to recruit smart, educated, tenacious members to their cause. Because once feelings of loyalty and powerless have been instilled, Smart members make the most effective members, kind of like employees. Lastly, if you want to inspire loyalty in the people around you, just follow these steps. Encourage your people to improve. Trust your people. Include your people and share their values. And if all that fails to inspire loyalty, just be there to greet them at the train station every day even if they ghost you for nine straight years. You've been listening to Re-Engineered You. Thank you so much for listening to the show. You mean the world to us. We have a new episode every week. You can connect with us at www.re-engineeredu.com where we have research links, show notes, and blog articles for every episode. We also appreciate feedback, and we love spirited debates. We're not experts in anything, but we've got an opinion on everything. And speaking of opinions, Todd, do we have a review to read? We do. An iTunes five-star review from MJ McFadden. Well-researched and super interesting. This podcast is a must explores a variety of ways relevant topics and uses historical examples to illustrate distinction while offering actionable and improvable conditions. Hey, this guy's pretty good. You might lose your writing gig here, Joe. I think I'm about to. <laughs> Use the word distinction. I've never heard that before. Yeah. Thank you so much. You guys, you wouldn't mean the world to us. We appreciate the support.